question, and it's taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 18, and it's entitled, Yo. I want to put some dis disclaimers out here. This is not the first time I'm preaching on this very important and very tricky and very difficult passage. Okay, this is about those who are contemplating to involve in a relationship. Okay, is that very clear? Now, if you're in the point of dating already, or if you have committed yourself to someone, or if you have married someone of different faith, this does not cover you. There are other passages in the New Testament that will deal with that, you know, like someone who's married to a non-believing non spouse and everything. This will cover mostly for those who are praying for a partner and for those who would like to get involved in a relationship. Are, are you with me? Come on with me, okay? This is very serious because from my track record of experience after preaching this message, there are people who walk away from the church. There are people who walk away from the congregation. But this is the word of the Lord, and it needs to be spoken to everyone. Now, yes, I would like us to approach this. I call this not preaching. I call this a conversation. Let's have an interaction, you know, like, a, like an exchange of ideas from, from the word and from your knowledge of the word, and how practical are the edicts that are presented in the word of God. And maybe the Lord, the Lord Holy Spirit will be the one to enlighten us. So let's just pray very quickly, even as we ask the Lord for help even today, this morning. Let us all pray. Father God, Holy Spirit, we ask for your wisdom. We ask for op an open mind and an open heart so that we could receive your word in its purest form. Um, the word that is spoken, the word that is mightier than a double-edged sword that could convict our hearts so that we could follow you. Help us, Lord, to respond to you well as we meditate upon your words this morning. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody say, okay, who among you here are in a relationship? Whether it's Facebook relationship or what? <laughs> like hashtag relationship goes on like in a relationship it appears on your newsfeed it's like oh this person is in a relationship could you please raise your hand no one so this is like a single congregation <laughs> pray about it because i think it's either end of 2017 or 2018 i'm gonna bring a friend of mine and a single guru you know like a singleness guru and she speaks on the plight of Christians in the Christian community who are like singles. And we're going to bring her from, from Melbourne. She has a book, and we're going to do a series of talk on being singles. But today, we're, we're talking about relationships anyway. Okay, let me just shoot you with a question. Should Christians date non-Christians? Yes or no? Who says yes? They sh <laughs> could you? Should you? Who says you could actually date non-Christians? Who says yes? Who says no? No one wants to make a stand here, right? You know, like, um, and, and the, the, the answer is pretty straightforward. When I was growing up as a, as a young believer, these books by Josh um, Harris actually taught me a lot. It's pretty straightforward there. It's defined. I kissed dating goodbye to him. There's no point in dating. There's no point in going through that process because God has someone that, that is for you, you know, and then he followed it up with boy meets girl. Of course, eventually he married someone, right? So he didn't, he did, didn't end up um, being single. And again, when I say single, again, don't be offended with that. We're just talking about the stage of life that you're in, whether you're in a relationship or whether you're not. And the simple answer that you would probably give, if, if you're a teenager, if you're a young adult and they ask you, say, um, is it okay to date a non-Christian? Then you would quote 2 Corinthians 6, 14a. Okay, well, do not be unequally yoked with um, an unbeliever. Do not be yoked together with a non-Christian. Have you heard that from someone? You know, like, has, has, have you even uttered that to a friend of yours um, of not being able to be yoked together um, with unbelievers? So it, it's really up to you. And this is something that's really, really relevant, especially for a very young segment of the crowd, you know? Um, do you believe in this verse? Who's, who's completely sold out that this is our antidote to the question, or this is the response to the question, should Christians date non-Christians, for that matter? Is this sufficient? Is this enough? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says this is taken out of context? 
Whoa, okay. <laughs> there are those people. Who are <laughs> Wait, are you dating non-Christians? No. Well, obviously not, right? You have, mar- you have married Christians. Beck, is your boyfriend a Christian? Sure. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and and that's, that's usually, when I, when I have conversations with, with young people, and they say, you know what, I'm dating. And then my next question automatically is like, is he or she a Christian? You know, it's, it's just automatic because I was brought up um, in this way. But you know what? I reckon I do agree with the fact that we throw this Bible verse to, the, to those people and, and, and we, we, we just utter it without even understanding the context completely. And if you ask me, is this weak? Is this a very weak support to the dating thing? Yes, definitely it is. It is weak, and that's why we need to probe it. I'm not dispelling this verse. You can still use this as a verse to say, well, you know what? You shouldn't be dating a non-Christian because the Bible says. But in this day and age, in the 21st century, you will get like blank stares from people. It's like, what? I don't even know what that yoke thing means. Anyone who knows what a yoke is? Have you seen a yoke? Can someone describe to me what a yoke is? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm not going to say it. What is that? Can someone just shout it out? What is a yoke? Okay, Tim. <laughs> Yes, sir. Okay. It's a piece of wood that connects two animals together. Yeah, very good. You know, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a piece of wood. So what does wood have to do with marriage anyway? What does wood have to do with, with dating? Well, to give you a more concrete example, this is what a yoke looks like. So the, the dimensions of the yoke should be like 0.4 BW to like, yeah. <laughs> Um, this is a yoke. This is an actual yoke, and in reality, this is how it looks like, right? So you have these stuff that are meant for the animal's neck, right? That's a yoke. And these are two cows being yoked together, and they're happy, right? You know? <laughs> is a yoke easy? No, actually, a yoke is a burden. Right? And the references of yoke in, in the New Testament, remember Jesus is asking, inviting you to have rest in him. He said, the yoke that I will give you is easy, and the burden is light. Could you imagine having a yoke like there? Now, that's not the point. The point of the passage is being yoked together. And if you're yoked together with someone who's different from you, this is how it looks like. There. So should we still discuss about this? I mean, yeah, from this perspective, it's pretty, pretty obvious that it's not meant to be. What would be some of the difficulties of these two animal species? What will they encounter as they're yoked together? What do you think will happen? Huh? Okay, one animal will be carrying the weight more than the other. Is that possible, though, like, like that? What else? Come on, shout it out. This is a conversation, eh? Come on. It looks so weird. Yeah, definitely. It looks so weird. Huh? One animal will kick the other. Is that? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, what? Maybe one animal will go to one direction and, and the other one will be... And if the other animal is lazy, then it's, it's, it's going to be tough. So this is a very explicit picture, actually, of being yoked together. And so there's, there's no more explanation. That's it. You, you cannot be that way. Now, the thing is, according to the Bible, which impending marriage does God counsel against? And I'm looking for very specific Bible passages that are so clear in the New Testament. Have you encountered one? I think that the, the second Corinthian passage is that one, but it's not very it's not even talking about marriage, it's being yoked with a non-Christian. So we have three premises here. Okay, a union between a Christian and a Christian. Good or bad? Good? A union between a non-Christian and non-Christian. What about a union between a non-Christian and a Christian? Now, if you, we use these combinations as formula, which do you reckon will be the most successful marriage? You will never know. And that's the point there, right? It's no guarantee. And I'm not, okay, again, let me qualify this. I'm not encouraging the young people to, you know, like to have relationships with someone of different faith because it, it comes with its own challenges. But the truth is there is no guarantee that the marriage will work because there are lots of cases of divorce among Christians as well, right? And that's the truth. 
right? Um, and sometimes there are very, very good marriages among non-Christians that, uh, that outlasts marriages of non-believers. I, I mean, believers for that matter. So there's no formula um, with it. Marriage is something that you work together. It's a commitment, right? It's not a Hollywood romance wherein you're in La La Land for a while and then afterwards when feelings go sour and then you said, okay, I'm not in love with you anymore. Okay? Are, am I clear with this? There is no guarantee that the marriage will work. Now let's go back to the passage. What is the passage talking about? So it says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Can we say this together? One, two, three, go. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. In some translations, it means to be mismated, to be mismatched, and to unite yourselves with unbelievers. Is there anything there in the passage that talks about being one with someone, or is, is it actually talking about dating per se? I think that's, that's the challenge here. Maybe this is the closest one, mismated, right? But in Australia, when we say, hi, mate, it doesn't mean that you're lovers, right? It's just your best friends, or yeah. So do, 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 do you get where I'm coming from here? So that's, that's, that's the tricky part here, brothers and sisters. Now, this is from the message. Don't become partners with those who reject God, okay? And the partnership there, the yoke that we're talking about, is not necessarily marriage. That is not this. Do not try to work together as equals with unbelievers. If you use this version, working together doesn't mean dating, right? It just means become, you know, like group projects in the university, for example, or like serving each other in the ministry. It, 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 it's, I think that's what I'm saying. That's the weakness of, of where the pa passage is. Now, to be yoked together, now these are some of the, the, the definitions of that, having unequal associations. Um, with someone. So you're a believer. Do not have in common, do not share or have partnership or having one accord or have an agreement. And I reckon that's the reason why they always talk about marriage because the most intimate and the, mo the strongest type of partnership is actually marriage, right? So, I mean, to be fair, because we've been using the passage over and over again. Just to be fair, there is a basis for using 2 Corinthians 6.14. As, as because, yeah, when you become one with the person, then definitely that partnership is stronger than a business partnership, right? It's not like you going for missions together or serving in the ministry. No, it's marriage. It's a marriage partnership. And that's why it is, it's the common interpretation. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Now, as we... As we unravel the, the passage, it says, For what do righteousness have wickedness in common? That's the premise of the Apostle Paul. Um, and he's talking about those who are saved and those who are being saved. Context here, Corinthians. How did we describe the Corinthians church? Multicultural, sinful, there's incest, there's suing of each other, you know, like um, uh, everyone's fighting together. What the apostle was trying to say is, hey guys, you know, you live in a very corrupted world. Maybe you should separate yourself from that corrupted world. And this is what they're saying. Do you have in common, you know, with an unsaved person? What do righteousness and wickedness have in common? We're talking about the way people live here. Central, are you still with me? Is there a difference between the lifestyle of a Christian and a non-Christian? Is there? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says I don't really see any difference? I think the third one is the most difficult part because a lot of times we are so no different from the rest of the world. Right? I mean, I'm just speaking truth here, brothers and sisters. In the context of the Corinthians, the Corinthian world is really, really corrupt. What the apostle wanted to do is, can you just separate from them and be different? But in the world that we're living right now, no one will know that you're a Christian, not unless you verbally tell them, you know what, um, I attend church on Sunday, and that's the only basis of your Christianity, actually, that, that thing on your sleeve. I attend the church, but that doesn't make you a Christian, actually. This is tough, right? This is tough. Because that's, that's the context of what we're trying to talk about. There has to be a difference. That's why if you even engage in that dating process, 
right? Okay, young boys. If you, you know, like, hey, hi, how are you? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Maybe too lame for them. You know. um, the thing is, the person that you are trying to connect with should see a difference in your lifestyle. Because once you open your mouth and you say, well, by the way, I am a Christian. And the, the other party says, like, oh, really? Seriously? I, I never knew that you were one. Then that's it. You don't have any more justification um, whatsoever about, you know, like, how different you are. Okay, personal sharing here. I was in the university. Oops, my, my wife and my, my daughter's like, I was in the university. We're um, our second year in, in my university. We're having a Christmas party. In the Philippines, we always have Christmas parties, right? You know, like, massive week-long class party, whatever. So, the usual party stuff, food, drinks, dancing and whatnot so it was like yeah so i was like really dancing with this person <laughs> i'm not gonna say a name <laughs> so we were like really dancing close as in really really close you know and i was like i was i was like like 18 years old you know like i was i was really young but i was a christian already i came to know the lord when i was 14 so we were like you know strobe lights and everything so i was like yay you know like dirty dancing i've had the time of my life <laughs> and she was really dancing close to me and i don't know for what reason uh, i said um by the way i'm a christian <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, "Oh, you know what? Me too." See, there you go. You know, and and then we looked at each other. Of course, we didn't kiss. We were like ashamed of each other because the way we were behaving on the dance floor was not really pleasing to God. So slowly, I said, "Can we just sit down? <laughs> Let's pray the sinner's prayer." <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's the thing. There's no difference at that moment when I was doing, and even for the girl who's like, yeah, compromising at that moment, we were not even aware. The faith was never a consideration. It's the law of attraction that draws us together. So that's that's the big question there. And then, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Again, it's still about the way of life. What? difference it is there from a christian way of life to a non-christian way of living and that's why being yo together is different even in the workplace even in the workplace people who do not know god would probably behave differently from the way you would people are doing accounts for that matter um you know there are gray areas there some will do shortcuts in terms of you know reporting you as a christian you're convicted no i need I, I, I need to do this. I need to live this according to what, what God is saying. Now, what harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Is there anything? Is there any common thread that goes, be, you know, like with Jesus and with Satan? I remember when I was a new believer, I was in high school, and I was like being discipled by this pastor. And I felt unfair because I came to know the Lord when I was 14, and all of a sudden, the world ended. You know, I couldn't do the things that I would like to do, right? That's, that's just my perception when I was a younger person. Um, and I felt like, and so I see, I see girls that I would like to, to know. And of course, being accountable to the pastor, I open up and I say, you know what? I like this person. And then he would ask me the same question. Is this person Christian? And I said, no. Um, and then, you know, my, my very sarcastic um, disciple would say, well, you know what? You can do whatever you want, you know? You can do that. But just remember, if you end up together, your father-in-law will be Satan. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so like, who's your, who's your father now? It's Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, it's God the Father and Jesus Christ is in you. But if you connect with someone who's not a believer and that person doesn't have Jesus in, in him and who rules over that person's life, yeah. It's Belial, you know, so it's like, and I was like, really? Seriously, of course, that is, I, I'm not, I don't want you to go even in, 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 in that kind of a mode. There's nothing to, you know, like, to substantiate that because I believe, you know, everyone has a chance to be embraced in the kingdom of God if they declare, they declare that Jesus is Lord. But this is, this is the truth. Um, there is no harmony be between Christ and, 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 and Belial. And what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols, really? You know, and talking about the temples, 
So in talking about the practical expression of the religion, I have a classmate um, in the university. Um, the mom married a non-Christian person. And this non-Christian person worships a different god, and so they have idols. Um, they were dating, and then eventually they got married. The guy, she was hoping that someday he would change, you know, but I mean, when I talked to, when, when I was having that conversation with my friend, we were already in the university. And this is what happens. On Sunday, they separate. So like, uh, they have two kids. So one is my friend, is the girl, and then there's a boy. So the boy goes with the dad in the temple, and, the mom go, uh, and, and she goes with her mom in the Christian church. That's how it works. And you can see how the, the practicalities of the expression of faith plays there, right? What about school? What if you finally have kids and, and you said, oh, I want the, my child to go to a Christian school. But what if the guy says, no, I want the, the child to go to a madrasa? What will you do, right? Or if you have a child, again, a, a, a child, and you say, like, the father said, I want the, the child to, to wear a, a hijab, for example, for the rest of her life, because that's the religious conviction from the other side. But you don't want your daughter to be in that same way. What happens? I think these are some of the practicalities that when you're in love, you don't even think about, because you, you feel like, well, you know what? Those things can be talked about eventually. Studies have shown that divorces within the evangelical circles in the States happen between mixed marriages because eventually they would have to yeah, part ways, you know. But it's really sad. It's really sad. And we're not going to talk about the marriage part because there are ways of going about it, especially if you have a spouse who's a non-believer. I think the pressure for you to be the light happens there. Don't even think about evangelism to the, to the ends of the earth like Bolivia. Your first mission field will definitely be your spouse. Are you still with me? Central. Okay. So it's like, why is he talking about this? And now there's no more chance, really, for me to date anyone. <laughs> right? <laughs> because the world has become so narrow. But you know what? If your desire is to have a partner, the Lord will provide for you if it's the right, <laughs> the right plan for, for your life. Okay, what, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Again, we've talked about this. It doesn't necessarily mean that if you're a Christian, you're an angel. And if you're a non-Christian, you're a demon. A lot of times it's interchangeable, right? And a lot of times people are repelled by the gospel because of the way we live our lives. And so what's the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 6? It's not about dating, brothers and sisters, right? It says here, for, let's read this together. One, two, three, go. For we are the temple of the living God. Read, come on. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and, let, and be separate, says the Lord. We have to be separate. Now, the challenge for us Christians in the 21st century is we cannot live as a separated community. We need to live with the rest of the people. We cannot be like hermits. I cannot challenge the international congregation in order for us to be holy, let us go to the Blue Mountains and create a community there and let's not talk to anyone else, no. And it just so happened that we're smack right here in the city, right? Just beside us, what do we have? A massage parlor, Dragonfly. I'm not promoting the brand, but they're just there, you know? <laughs> and then across the street, you know, there's this pub, right? That's teaming on Friday nights. Um, Murphy's, uh, what's the, it's the Irish pub, right? Um, yeah, and on Friday nights, it's stinky there. You know, it's like, bleh, bleh, you know, like that kind of thing. What, what can you do? We cannot separate from the world. We need to reach out to these people, but we should know where, where we stand. Now, we cannot be like, okay, Central Baptist Church just worships there, and we don't really care about the people elsewhere. Cannot be that way um, as well. So it's all about holiness. The passage is all about holiness, which make it, makes it more difficult. So it's not just talking about marriage. It's not talking about dating. It's talking about being holy, being set apart. Holiness in the Bible is being set apart. Can you say that to your seatmates, whom you believe are Christians? Say, can you tell them, you are holy? You are holy. And following that is like, you know what? You are set apart. Can you say that? You are set apart. <laughs> okay, let's, let's follow it up again. It's like, you know what? You should be different. <laughs> right? I, 
and that's, that's just it. So let's not even talk about dating because if you use it as a passage for dating, it doesn't, it doesn't really have that punch, but if you approach it from the context of holiness, it becomes more difficult, right? So whatever became of holiness, that's the question. Brothers and sisters in Christ, are we holy? We are the people of the Lord. We have been set apart by God through Jesus Christ. We are holy. But do the world see our holiness really, brothers and sisters? Do they? So this is a question. So before a young person would come to me and talk about like, okay, should I date this Christian or non-Christian? The first thing that I would ask you is like, how have you been living your life, bro? And then, of course, the person would just, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not saying that I'm holier than that person. I'm, I, I struggle the same way. Now, this is um, something that I, I, I saw from the internet. It's like, I hope your interfaith wedding leaves everyone feeling like their religion won. It happens this way. To compromise, you have two different weddings, right? So you have a Christian wedding, and then you have a non-Christian wedding. Is it about that? Is it about the battle of religions? Is it about which, which heritage wins from this? No, it's not. It's about the lordship of Christ um, in the life. Now, okay, I know some of you will never chat with me ever after this. Okay, this is a conversation with a disciple. <laughs> I walked through him when he was 13 years old, and he became older, and I was there for him every step of the way. And then all of a sudden, after so many years later, he told me that finally he has a girlfriend. Okay, so I said, um, first response, right? So from which church is your girlfriend, bro? Um, and then she, he said, he, she's churchless, and it broke my heart. It's like, so many years of investment in your spirituality, bro. This is what you do to me. <laughs> and then he followed. See, look at my response. Okay, it's good that I did just, I, I was tempted to just put K there, K. But I said, okay. So I was fuming already here, right, at 9.03 p.m. <laughs> and then he followed it up, which made me more upset. He said, like, got to convert her one day. Pray for that, bro. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to pray for her. She's going to go to hell. No, no. <laughs> of course not. And did, did you see how I responded? It's like, hmm, it's God's work, bro, not mine anymore. <laughs> right? I'm so not going to engage you anymore after this. And then he cited this. He said, like, you know what? Just like grandma, we took so many years. See, apparently the grandma, when she was on her deathbed, prayed to receive Jesus, and she became a Christian. Whoa. <laughs> so how do you respond to that? And I was like, okay, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the bye-bye part. Talk to you later. You know, I got to help out first. But it's not, it's not all gloom and doom, because I had a youth um, leader who dated a Muslim person, actually, while he was the head of the youth ministry, like, it's like in the position of Matt Quatch now for Blaze. How would you feel that when he comes to you, you I, I always invite them for a nice dinner, you know, like, okay, what do you want? Uh, steak, okay, then we order, we're having a nice meal. He said, um, Pastor John, I'm together with a Muslim girl. I was like, seriously, bro? You know, like, um, and this is the context of Singapore. We have multicultural, we have Hindus, Muslims, and you know. And I'm like, what do you want me to say? You know what's in the word, right? What can I do? You know, I should take the, the steak away from him. I'm like, don't deserve that treat, you know, brother. But I was there. So eventually they, they split up. And I didn't force him. When I was younger, when I was in the Philippines as a youth pastor, if you're serving in the ministry and I find out that you're dating a non-Christian, you're going to be grounded for ministry. You know, can you just take a disciplinary action leave for like six months? I said, if you cannot convert the person for six months, then don't come back here, you know, that kind of thing. I was so fierce, you know, but I mellowed down already in Singapore. So I was like, okay. So then I let him be, and then he stepped, I mean, you know, like he went to the army. Years later, he dated again. Uh, this time it's a Chinese girl. So I said, okay, multi uh, yeah, same culture, it's fine. Um, she's not Malay anymore. Um, she, he dated a non, uh, so I said like, Question, uh, the, the, the question again, is she a Christian or not? And then he said, well, she's not a Christian. And I'm like, 
haven't you learned? You know, like, it's not really going to work. But you know what? He's a pastor right now, and his wife actually converted to the faith. So what, how do you make sense of it? And I'm not encouraging anyone, but what I'm trying to say is that there's no formula here. There's no formula. So I can condemn this guy for all I care, you know, but, but what can I do? The thing is, yeah, this is, and this is the, the false premise, you know, like when people date someone from a different faith, they feel that they can actually convert them. Um, this is just practical advice for marriage, okay? Don't marry to expecting to change the person that you're going to marry. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The change will happen mutually to both of you, you know? So it's not going to work. There's no commonality between an apple and an orange, an orange and you cannot, you cannot put them together. Now, what, what is the Bible telling us about this? Can we, can we read this together? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. One, two, three, go. Yeah. So what is the, the second Corinthians passage all about? It's about holiness. It's thrown back at you. You want to live your life as holy person separated for God, then you will do the things that God wants you to do. Now, my response to you would be, this is it. Everything is per permissible, bro. But I tell you, not everything is beneficial. And in the practical outworking of a relationship with someone of different faith, it's not going to be easy. If you feel that, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bear with this. This is going to be my Calvary for life. You know, I'm going to carry my non-believing spouse with me to the grave. Yes, you go to hell together. No, that, that, that's not what I mean. It's like, yeah, it's, it's really up to you. But the Bible says not everything that you choose to do would be beneficial. For you okay am i answering the question should you date non-christians or what um i reckon my final thought would be okay listen to me central you just have to draw the line you just have to draw the line you just know where it should be you can push the boundaries for all you want but it, you will be the one to suffer the consequences of your decisions Really. And again, I'm not saying that, yeah, if you marry a Christian, the marriage is going to work. No, no formula, no guarantees there. Okay? So it's about us. It's about your standing before God. It's about the things you value. It's about you and your relationship with Jesus. I think that's, that's where the line is. A lot of times we don't even think of God. That God is not part of that. That when you engage in dating and establishing relationship, God is just somewhere. It's just like a label that you wear in your sleeve. It shouldn't be that way. Okay? Are you with me, Central? And this time we're going to enter the, the place of God and we're just going to repent. I think the response of the congregation should be repentance. If you have not been living your Christian life the way that you should be living it, if you're not being good witnesses to your friends, if they don't see any difference in you, then it's about time you say, okay, from this day forward, I will make it a little bit more obvious that I actually believe in Jesus. Is that, is that a fair enough challenge? I'm not asking a lot. I'm not asking you to be a priest or a nun and to go to the mountains to be hermits. I just want you to do that one step a bit to take your, your, your faith seriously, brothers and sisters. Are you with me? And that's the challenge for Central Baptist Church. If you want this church to be powerfully witnessing to the world out there, they should see it from us, that we're different from them. We're more loving, we're more understanding, we're more hospitable, we're more embracing of everyone without compromising our faith. Can I have an amen for that? Now, for those of you who are married to a non-Christian spouse. And you can search the scriptures. You don't need to divorce your partner. You just need to witness to them. Do you need to throw the Bible at them to, for them to be converted? No. You show it through your life. Right? And that's the most difficult part. Okay? Uh, do we have time? A lot of times, when you have a non-believing, a non-Christian partner or a spouse, they will see you. 
And if you behave badly, you will get the criticism right away. Oh, is that the way Christians should be? Is that the way it should be? You know, like that kind of thing. And it's painful, right? It's painful, you know. But that's, that's the part of the bargain there. According to the Bible, it's through your actions that you will win them, hopefully, so that they can be with God. A lot of praying, a lot of witnessing in love. You cannot force them. They, you may be able to force them to come to church, but if they, they never have an encounter with God, they will never change. The same way with your children, for that matter. Okay. So let us all stand and let us sing a song and let's approach the throne of God in with much humility, really. And this is a song that we sang a few weeks back. It's called Give Us Clean Hands. Think of your lives, brothers and sisters. Have you been living a life that is pleasing to Jesus? If not, this is the best time for that. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then this is the best time for you to embrace Him and say, hey, you know what? This pastor is talking about something good, I reckon. Then maybe you can invite Him to your heart as well. Okay, so let's, let's make this as our prayer this morning when we sing this song.
tough, right? It's a very tough challenge for everyone. And I would like us to journey together as a community here. If you are with your spouse right now, I want you to hold on to your spouse. And I want you to pray with your spouse, regardless of whether they believe in Jesus or they in the process of knowing Jesus. We know that the Lord brought you together and so therefore you need to bless them. You need to offer that. If you are with a friend or if you are with someone, with, with a believer in this congregation, I want you to pair up with, with another person and from there, speak words of encouragement and prayer that, you know what? It's very difficult to be a Christian, really, seriously. Who says it's easy to be a, a, a legit, <laughs> a legit, genuine Christian in this day and age? It's, it's tough. So I want you to just pray with someone so that you will just feel that, hey, I'm not, I'm not the only one living worldly here, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I have someone who will understand with me, okay? So we'll spend, you know, the next three minutes just pair up with someone and pray with that person together. For spouses, do pray with, with, with your partners because it's very important for you to be together. And as a community, you know, just pair up. So, so let's, can, can we do that, brothers and sisters? Just pray for, for, for that person. Hey, we're in this thing together. We're all struggling as believers here. We're not perfect. If there's anyone perfect here, come and pray for me. <laughs> I'm not even perfect, so I need, I need you. Come on, go go and pray. Pray for one another and pray for God really to make us pure. Come on, come on church. You can pray standing up, you can pray sitting down. And then don't leave yet because we're going to close in prayer together, okay? So you have, come on, pray for someone and... Come on, brothers and sisters, do this. Come on, please pray. Yes, God. Central, the Lord is here. The Lord is here right now. Tell him, God, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to be pure and to be holy before you. And here we are, just trying our best to be in your mighty presence. Oh, God. God. Oh yes, Jesus. We glorify your name, O oh God. Yes, God. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, God. Come on, the Lord is here. Continue to be in the spirit of prayer. Just pray, and then we're going to sing the song once again, and we're going to close in prayer. Just, just be in the presence of God right now. Let me pray for you right now, brothers and sisters. Father God, you can see your community here trying their best to help each other out. Lord, we are not perfect, and we have failed you a lot of times, but because of your grace and your goodness and mercy, Lord, here we are, and we're just trying our best. Help us to be a generation, Lord, that seeks your face. Help us to be a generation that will keep your name, Lord, in our lives, that, that will keep your lordship in our lives, Lord, and that will live our lives um, for your glory. Lord, this is our prayer in Jesus' name, and everybody say, Amen. Let us all stand again, and let's just sing the, the chorus. Let us ask the Lord for clean hands. So give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be, oh God, let us be a generation that sees. Your place, oh God.
challenge for this week brothers and sisters just ask yourself am i living a life that is set apart for god if the answer is yes well done if the answer is no well you better start working on it <laughs> you know thank you so much the service is over may you be a blessing uh, to one another and again connect with those people we have a lot of new people here for those of you who are here for the first time just tell them hey we're new here no, would you like to connect with me? No, no, that's a reverse process. God bless you. God bless you, Central. Go and be a blessing to others. Yeah.